Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the show. I am so thrilled. It's been quite some time since my guest appeared the last time, 2019, just when I had discovered Partimento for the first time in that fateful June, uh, that, and then that those ensuing months, I just got so fascinated with Partimento that I discovered this wonderful guest who is a really eminent scholar and very much learned in this tradition, and he's contributed so much to the scholarship, a very important person in the community and in the movement and in music education, theory, and history. This is the great Professor Peter Van Tour. Peter, welcome to the show. Thank you. It's really a delight to have you. Can you, can you believe it's been almost four years since our very first interview? And that time, it was just an audio interview. So we're, we're now actually going, we're stepping up. We have all, we have we have some video. We have some actually some very nice slides prepared for the guests. Uh, I mean, for the audience, it's going to be really a tremendous show. We have so much to show the audience, and I think that this interview will be a very special one. So, first of all, uh, Peter, why don't you just introduce yourself? Um, a, a brief introduction to yourself and what you've been doing in the last four years. Yes, well, I think the last time we we talked, I think I, I talked from Gotland when I might be the, the year before I started my job in Oslo. And I started, started a, um, a position in, in, at the Norwegian Academy of Music where I was for three years. And uh, after that, I, I got a new position in Sweden um uh, at Örebro University so there I, I have been now for one year and I'm teaching music theory here that's fantastic um I I can't I mean it really it's how do I describe this so you've been so influential in my life just because I got into Partimento and and your work has been incredibly influential and um, so I just wanted to pay you that compliment that you've been a very important person in my journey and with your research. And you still continue to produce these tremendous articles. And uh, also, I cannot stress enough for people who are not uh, in the Facebook group, The Art of Partimento, and of course, you know, the other groups that are related, Peter is very very helpful for people who are answering questions because there are so many questions. I mean, this is something, this is a tradition that was dead, dead in the water, almost practically extinct. And I'm so glad we have ex experts and scholars who really did the legwork. Quite literally, Peter, could you just describe, you were actually in archives looking at manuscripts, building a, a database and really trying, because can you just describe the scale of the scholarship necessary to kind to, to really revive this in a very, I would say detailed, comprehensive, and scholarly way. Yeah, well, I, I, I must say that we've been a, a whole bunch of people who are who have been collaborating. So it's it's really a, a team effort we have been doing. So I I build I have built I've been able to build my work on 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 work that my predecessors have done. So I'm very grateful to the ones who came before me. <laughs> Um, yes, I, I have been uh, uh, traveling quite a lot and, and photographing and collecting things and making this database uh, or, or these databases. I built one for Solfeggi and one for Partimenti. And um, I think it's about 60,000 photos. <laughs> oh, wow. uh, so it's, um, I think there are some 20,000 partimenti in the database. 20,000? Yes. That's They're incredible. not all online yet, but uh, there's a lot on my computer that I have been, um, that will appear eventually. Now, when you say 20,000, is that 20,000 unique different partimenti? No, uh, 20,000 items in the database. Right, so and because... 
is it because that sometimes there are many manuscripts and there's the same partimento in many different manuscripts and it gets very confusing the order sometimes they're copied in a different sometimes there's the partimento is slightly changed uh, yeah. could you describe uh, the how they appear in the database for instance the the partimenti of durante or feneroli yeah so one of the big problems with neapolitan um 18th century scholarship is that um, um, Naples practically didn't have any music printing. Uh, the reason for that was that there were so many castrati that uh, didn't really succeed in their singing careers and they ended up in, in, in copy shops uh, copying music. And so we had these yeah, dozens of copy shops where where well-educated singers were were writing by hand and in order to be able to to sell all these manuscripts they often put the wrong name on the front page you know if they put the name of scarlatti on the front page it would sell better than right if they, right so so many of these attributions are um are highly questionable so <laughs> uh, you really want to sort out what can be true of, of all this. Can you uh, give so an example? Of, yeah, give an example of uh, what you like, an example of where you found a misattribution. Oh, well, there are many of them. Um, um, many, many manuscripts have one attributions to one. We will see one in the slides actually today. Okay where there is um, uh, Nicolas Sala on the front page, and then you see the content of the manuscript is something entirely different. <laughs> so, and that can only, only be sorted out by, by putting everything in the database and you, you finally see that oh, this is just not trustworthy at all. <laughs> right? and this is highly probable. So it takes a, it takes a lot of work to to sorted out how many manuscripts are there in total i mean in existence can we guess that amount and are they all in the database have you managed to find most of them or are there still collections that are yet unfound yes i i don't know exactly but i would think maybe five six hundred or, so, or something like that okay it's an estimation, but and I think maybe I have still a little wish list of manuscripts that I would <laughs> like to would like to photograph one day. But um, and my wish list is maybe maybe fifty manuscripts or something like that. Okay, okay. Is there a composer that needs def that definitely needs more attention on from the Neapolitan school? There are many. Um, there is so much uh, work still to be done. Um, the situation for uh, Leonardo Leo is an imp extremely important composer. And uh, the manuscript situation is very, very difficult. It's extremely difficult to, to point out which pieces are by Leo and which are not. Mm. So that would be one my highest priority to see if we could sort Leo out because his music is so extremely good. Yeah, I agree. And what's the difference in Solfeggio scholarship versus Partimento scholarship with respect to the database? Um, the Solfeggio are more complicated. Um, there, are, there are many more Solfeggi. Um, it's m much more diverse, more difficult to sort out what is what. Um, so the problems are even bigger in Solfeggio than in Partimento, I would say. In terms of sheer quantity, are there more Solfeggi versus Partimenti? Yes. Okay. Just in just the, there's a lot more. And by at magnitude, by magnitude, how much would you say there is? Um, I think my wish list for Solfeggi is maybe ten times as big. <laughs> <laughs> wow, wow. That's still so much. Only the Florence Conservatory 
I think I could work there a few months to just photograph. Mm. So it's a lot, and uh, and that will would generate maybe one year of work with the database. Yeah, and I don't have the time anymore to do it. But right, right. <laughs> well, I think uh, let's get into the the beautiful presentation that we've prepared for today's interview, which is, uh, Peter, why don't you describe what we've prepared, what you've prepared today and what we're going to talk about? Yeah, so what I, what I would like to share with, uh, with our audience today is I would like to, to show uh, how, what you can see in a Partimento, so how, how we can read uh, and, and understand what we see because this entire uh, bunch of, uh, of uh, repertoire, um, um, it, there are, there are uh, several different lineages and, and schools within this repertoire. And it would be good to, to share uh, some thoughts about how you can see to what lineage the, mu the music we are dealing with um, belongs and what that means for our interpretation or our, our reading or our, our realization of the material. And you're not even just saying Naples, is because there's also other cities that have done Partimento, Bologna, for instance. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the stuff I, I, I gather today is, is mostly Neapolitan, but um, absolutely the, the Bologna tradition is, is yet another uh, topic. Great. Yeah. Okay. So why don't you give us the guided tour? <laughs> okay. So the first thing I would like to, to if we imagine we, we would come to Naples and we would, would start to take lessons, um, many of these uh, European boys from, from France or, or Portugal or um, from England, when they arrive to Naples, they would knock on the door. Um, uh, probably with a with a with a letter from some mm. um, some um, ambassador or something, an, an important person, and they would uh, ask for for lessons. And um, uh, many of these uh, students would orientate. So, what what are my dreams? Would I like to work? Uh, in uh, in the church uh, music business, or would I like to work in in the opera business? So um, we can hear from if we imagine what these headmasters would would tell us what to do, we could orientate ourselves uh, what school to to pick. Absolutely right. So I tried to put my knowledge about these um, about these schools into uh, an imaginary dialogue with a, <laughs> with a headmaster, right? So here we knock on the door of the Pietà Conser Conservatory and we would talk with Leonardo Leo. Wow. Who was the headmaster there in the 1740s. Um, so I think he would answer something like this. Um, if you would ask, what should I do, uh, dear uh, Maestro Leonardo? What, what should I do to become a good composer? I think he would ask, answer, the best way to learn music is simply to sing. Um, right. You see that in the Pietà very, very uh, clearly that the start is with, with the solfeggi. Um, and right. the Leo solfeggi are absolutely foundational in this school. So use the Leo solfeggi as your guide. They contain everything you need. Right? right, so right. there's melodic stuff, and there is contrapuntal stuff, and there are many, um, many uh, commonly used patterns that you will uh, store in into your head uh, for future use in, in counterpoint. And, right. And could you could you comment a little bit about the way that the, they did solfeggi? Because it, it's not the same way that when people think of solfege, they think of fixed do, movable do, but they had something unique, right, at that time. Yeah, I imagine that um, when we say sol solfege or solfeggio, you think about the subject, right? Yeah. So if you go to the conservatory today, you would you would get on your schedule a subject <laughs> that's solfeggio. Right. At that time, uh, the subject was called canto, 
Okay. Right? So you, you went to the singing teacher and the materials were called sol solfeggi, mm. right? So it was the material for the singing lessons that were called solfeggi. Right. So right. it's basically a, a part of the of the singing, uh, teaching and learning, um, where you worked with with solfeggi. In conservatory today, we have ear training class. Would we find that in Neapol in Naples? No, not uh, not as a separate subject. And and w w one could say that's strange, but but it was uh, it was basically everywhere. So there was no need to have a separate subject subject because it was in the singing clause, it was in the partimento clause. We were doing this in in orchestras, in uh, singing groups, in the church, in singing like a uh, liturgical chant and so on. Right. So everything was done by by ear and by imitation. So they didn't need the the subject of ear training. Yeah. Very interesting. So the second thing he would say is, uh, it's all about counterpoint, my friend. <laughs> you can't write a proper fugue. You'll never succeed in this business. <laughs> well, if you look at the counterpoint notebooks from this school, you will see that they contain fugues, 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 fugues. It's all, it's nothing but fugues, right? Yep. It's beginning two part fugues, then three part fugues, then four part fugues, then four part fugues with text, then four part fugues with text and orchestra, and then four part fugues as part of a mass, and then as part of a, a setting of the Dixie Dominus, etc., etc. So it was all centered around fugues, and only after that you would start to write arias, some duetti maybe a, a section for a, for a future opera or something like that. But that was maybe three, four, five years later, right? Right. Now, I wanted to say, you know, when, when people hear the word fugue, they immediately think of German, you know, they think of Bach, they think of, you know, uh, they think of that, I guess, that tradition. They, they think of the well-tempered clavier. Is it, What's the difference in the Neapolitan or the Partimento tradition? I mean... The Naples conservatories. When you say fugue, is that is it like Bach? Well, the the fugues. I would describe it that they are they are a bit looser. Uh, they are not so so extremely um, um, detailed in in the material as the well tempered clavier. It's an, the well tempered clavier. I think is an exceptional uh, collection. The, the Italian fugues and especially the Neapolitan fugues, they are they are made from improvisation. So, so they are looser and and uh, a little bit more spontaneous, maybe. And um, um, so, for for uh, for a player, if you want to make fugues with your head, uh, the Neapolitan tradition is very interesting. And uh, one sure. more, one more quick comment question on the fugue. The I think in the Paris Conservatory, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to mispronounce his name. Gedalge, I think, has a academic fugue. Is that somewhat similar to the Neapolitan fugues? Yeah, the the Gedalge uh, tradition is is uh, maybe 100 years later or even more. Um, and um, there is still a lot of information in Jadalj that that reminds of what the Neapolitans were doing. So I think it's clearly connected. Okay, but, uh, but it's right; it it becomes fixed. Mm. Right? So so that becomes a a standard way to do things. But that was the same in in Bologna in the eighteen twenties and eighteen thirties and forties. There were all the also standard patterns in the improvised fugue. So. It's not so very different as one one might think. Right. Now you said two voice fugues, and and because yeah. when people think of fugues, they think of eight voices, six voices, things you know, it's going crazy. But two voice fugues. Yes, that's uh, that's uh, what what Bach worked with too. There is a the, uh, Bach had had a collection of of some seventy two part fugues. That are lost, uh, unfortunately. But 
um, um, I think he worked with uh, with the same kind of two-part fugue in the beginning with students to learn how to make fugues. That, that sounds like a great didactic tool. Yeah. And so now... that the, if we would imagine what Durante would would uh, would answer, he would say something very different. <laughs> Because he would say, if you can't write a proper aria or a duetto, you'll never succeed in this business. <laughs> so he wouldn't point at church music or fugues, but he would uh, he would point at the melodic quality of the music, right? So sure, counterpoint is if you would ask, but but what about counterpoint in fugue? Um, you talk about arias, but. Uh, then you would probably say, well, sure, counterpoint is very important, but I wouldn't waste all my time on few. <laughs> yeah? Because that's very clear from the counterpoint notebooks, from the Durante tradition, they really downplay that, that uh, part of, of uh, right. the instruction. It won't help you at all in opera. <laughs> yeah? If you want to do opera, don't waste all your time on fugues. Uh, it's better to to train your uh, to to use your time to to become very good to to touch the heart of the listener and to make very good ma melodies and that's exactly what the the Italian opera tradition has has uh, has done. I mean, Bellini, Donizetti, Verdi. It's all about melody, right? So the Durante tradition became extremely important for the 19th century opera tradition in in Italy, rather than the Leo tradition, which was a little bit old fashioned and it more or less died away. What I find so interesting is if you look at their respective careers, Leonardo, Leo and Durante, wasn't Durante more well known as a church musician and Leo actually wrote more operas. And yet it seems in the school of counterpoint, it switched. And Durante, as you say, is talking more about writing for operas. And Durante and, and Leo is mentioning counterpoint fugues and counterpoint and fugues. Yeah. So the old tradition um, in Naples was the tradition of, Le of uh, Leo. So if you look at the teacher of Leo, for example, uh, Nicola Fago, and Fago was teaching more or less in the same tradition as, as Leo. And the teacher of Fago was also doing the same old fashioned church music <laughs> tradition. So the, the person who really put things upside down was, was actually Durante. And that was for strategic reasons. Yeah? Although he had an, an excellent uh, education in church music and he was basically only composing uh, <laughs> music, he realized that his students didn't need this old fashioned stuff to succeed in the opera business because the opera business is what you could uh, earn money with, right? Right. If you wanted, and especially those who wanted to become singers, they went into the opera business. Now, only Naples had had several opera houses with lots of uh, things going on there. Yeah, so right. he really adapted. Uh, he he changed his counterpoint um, curriculum towards. Um, a flexibility in, for for becoming opera and op a good opera composer. Mm -hmm. That's that's very very interesting. And Fenaroli, Fedeli Fenaroli, perhaps the most famous teacher, was a student of Durante. What did he also study with Leo, or just Durante? Yeah, he was he was in the in the in the Durante lineage. Absolutely. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay. Um, and maybe we should also mention the keyboard fluency in this quote: skills in modulation. Yeah. So, so what what Durante emphasized is to become flexible in in building music, right? So, um, if you imagine, if you if you have to compose music for the opera, then maybe a, a, a mean character comes onto the scene, and you have to to do something that underlines what is going to happen. So you you need to be flexible and. Mm. Modulation is very important, and the character of the music is very important. The melodies are very important, and uh, uh, so so the tradition is more about um, 
um, the flexibility of shaping things. Yeah? So the line, the harmonic line of the music becomes very, very important because that that's like the steering wheel of the of the composer. Right? Brilliant. Brilliant. And that 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 is that you can see in the partimento tradition and you can see it in the counterpoint tradition that it's all about this this dramaturgy and flexibility in steering the music towards uh, various points where you want to go yeah? and and in the leo tradition this is very different because in leo it's more like you have a main key and you you keep to that key and it's more about the unity of the fugue it's not a, all about the flexibility or quick moves to that place or quick moves to that place. Mm. It's that's a, a different, a different uh, thing. It's very interesting. So if we look at some, uh, what I would like to do now is I would like to to show the characteristics what we're talking about now. Okay, right. I just selected a few uh, photos with um, partimento stuff from both traditions and i would like to show how you can see this right let's go so, so this uh, this first page is uh, material by leonardo leo and the first thing uh, you can see here that on top here you see quite a few ties you see that yeah there's a tie be between the first and second a measure right and then right. there's a tie there and the format and the tie there yes yes yeah. besides that you see also that there are many uh dissonant figures such as right. the two right yeah. the sharp four there are many sevens on downbeats yes you can imagine that that the the this music uh, will sound very linear and very very contrapuntal, right? You can almost see it from the from the very appearance of the uh, of the of the music, mm. and it's also true with the second one uh, in the middle. You get one in three eight bar. You see that? Right. It can be slightly darker, and there you have also ties. Right. One tie, another one, another one. Lots of ties. Yeah. So if you would just look statistically, how many ties does Leo use and how many does Durante use? Uh, Leo will win. <laughs> okay? That's for sure. Just because of the the more uh, old-fashioned contrapuntal style. Right, right, right. There's one other thing I would like to point at here, and that is that um and it's difficult to see but the last line of the first one let me zoom in start, here yeah it starts um uh, it has a, a c clef in the beginning you yep. see that and this c clef means that the last note of the of the first piece is actually a d hmm. right although it started in g so this this piece doesn't end on the tonic it doesn't end on the on the main key of the piece right yeah and then there's a little fermata at the end just before the the end uh, yeah the end line and that means okay wait a little bit uh, wait wait a bit and then you continue with the next one so really what you, what oh they, they flow into each other they flow into each other okay. so what you see here that uh, uh, Leo often um, composes his partimenti as pairs of pieces. Okay. This is exactly the same with the solfeggi. He also composes the solfeggi with a slow and a fast movement. Right, right. The difficult thing is, is uh, uh, though, uh, it is very difficult to identify these pairs. Mm. So that might be the topic of, for, a, for a dissertation, if, if someone could build some computer program to sort it out it's extremely difficult with why, several why, why do you say that is that because people put the wrong pairs together exactly yeah oh wow okay because there's so many copies of copies of copies so we don't have the autographs where they are okay. in the right connections so um now in this case i'm pretty sure that this is a 
this is a correct pair, but uh, in many cases, I'm not sure. Wow, very interesting. Imagine you're playing it very diligently to the score and then you play then the, then the next one is a completely unrelated part of mento <laughs> because of a copyist mistake yeah 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 so so the, these endings in the dominant are are a, a little um a little a signal for us to see aha okay this is not the end of the mm. of we there is a there is a, a piece following and which one would it be and that the database could be of help to yes. see all the possible connections and are there any connections that appear more frequently than others, then that could be a hint that this might be the one. Should right. we take so a look at the at the uh, another one, the, the next slide? Absolutely. So this is also Leo. Yeah, this is also Leo. So this is a piece in uh, C minor. And here we have a, a piece that's, that is a, a unique source. There's only one uh, source of this um, of this piece. Um, um, there is no attribution, yep. so we don't we we're not uh, hundred percent sure that it is by Leo, but uh, I'm I'm quite convinced, or I'm I'm quite sure that it is by Leo. Uh, and that's because that you've seen so many of his partimenti, and you can determine the style. Yeah. Well, here at the end of the of the piece, you see Siegue la fuga. Mm. Huh? So we know that, aha, okay, a fugue will follow, right? And okay. if we look at the last piece, if you look at the next uh, page, uh, this is uh, without any doubt a fugue by Leo. Okay. Huh? And in this case, the fugue and the, and the largo uh, have patterns, so melodic patterns that are uh, identical. So they are they are connected uh, in the material in the key, and uh, and uh, the first one is a unique partimento. So I'm quite sure that this this is a correct pair. Okay. Of two pieces by Leon. Yeah. Is the is the key signature the same helpful in that regard? Yeah, absolutely. The the key signatures. Uh, if you have two pieces in the same key after each other, that signals that they belong together. Okay, so that you won't have, or it's rather more rare to have them in separate keys. Yeah, of course we we cannot be hundred percent sure, but okay. Um, I I think um, most of these pairs are in the same key. Yes. Okay. Okay. So if you summarize in the next uh, page, okay. To the characteristics of the school of Leo, I would say first thing you can see that many of these pieces are are written in pairs or groups of pieces can be sometimes three or four pieces in the same key, in key too. Mm. Um, we are invited to identify and realize all kinds of imitations. There are many imitations appearing. Yes. Um, um, the, the many of the uh, partimenti in the school of Leo are built from themes or counter subjects or both, right? Themes and counter subjects. So it is a kind of so, uh, soggetto counterpoint, I call it. It's it's counterpoint that is based on the use of a theme, right? Mm. Just because it's all directed towards the fugue, so that's becomes very natural. Right, right. And then we find a lot of ties, um, signaling su suspension. So it's all old, old, fas old fashioned uh, counterpoint. And um, yeah, and then there's one more thing. If we go back one slide, okay, we have this little sign in the beginning. If you, if you, oh, shall we zoom in a little okay. bit? You zoom in a little bit. Yeah, see this little sign. So I've never seen this sign in the school of Durante. Ah. Okay. Uh, so, so this is really old fashioned um, fugue thinking. It's a sign to show here the sound, the counter subject should enter. Oh, okay. Yeah? Okay. Um, and this is called a singum congruencia. It's a, it's a sign to, to, um, to mark entries. Ah, okay. It could be a, of a theme too. So counter subject or themes. 
Okay, okay. That makes sense. Okay. So if we can look at what the, what the, the school of Durante looks like, here we have a, an example of, uh, of a page of, uh, of Durante stuff. Now, um, here you see that uh, um, there is a little text on top, Legatura di Nona. So this is about the ninth. Yeah, it's a little example, uh, or actually two of them, mm -hmm. um, where he shows. Right? Mm -hmm. Um, so what he wants to show is how you how you properly prepare the ninth. Here you have the ninth. Yep. Yeah? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. And it has to be um, um, the resolution has to be. Uh, stepwise downward stepwise down that's brilliant so he, in his manuscripts he gives these examples and they're direct from him yeah absolutely so wow. <clears throat> the partimenti if you look at the little piece that is underneath um, are actually uh, exemplifications of the rule that he gives so mm. you learn uh, uh, partimento uh, in the school of durante he will he will guide you through the system of the figure so you will get some exercises for the fourth and some exercises for the seventh right. and a few for the ninth which we see here and a few with uh, sequential patterns and cadences and so on um, and then the, the the partimenti actually are designed to train these specific elements right, right? So if you have a, a, a partimento in the tradition of Durante school, then there is often this, the, you can ask the question, okay, what is Durante trying to teach us here? What is the, the partimento about? Yeah? And the answer will be not a theme or a, or a contrapuntal. Oh, right, like Leo. Like Leo, but it will be about often a figure or a certain, a certain element. Right, so there's more. It's more like an elementary approach to mm. learning accompaniment of thoroughbars and uh, and partimento. So Leo does not approach his instruction in this way. No. And if he he's doesn't. if he's going to teach four three and nine eight, what? How would he explain nine eight or four three? Yeah, I think it will be. Uh, um, that there are uh, there are small books with uh, with text and there is a there is a a little learning book so i think the basics were done more on paper yeah before you started to do the the more contrapuntal stuff on the keyboard okay okay now this slide is crazy look let's take a look at this <laughs> very busy slide yeah so it's very densely written so if you look on top, the first one, if we zoom in a little bit. Okay. Okay. You see in the corner that uh, the name of Durante appears. Right. The attribution is correct. This is all by Durante. It's a, it's a page uh, from the Santini collection in Münster in, uh, in, in Germany. And the piece on top is actually such a piece that exemplifies the nine. Mm. Yeah, so if we look at the bass, and there you have the first nine, a nine, a nine, and a nine, you see? So there are lots of nines uh, in, this, in this pattern and, and in the rest of the piece too. So this piece is really connected to the curriculum to the position where the teacher has taught you to do these uh, little examples with a nine, and then you get a little piece to 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 make it work. Uh, yeah. Peter, uh, one thing about looking at the partimenti is very interesting because prior to me getting into partimento, it was always interesting that 
the experts like yourself, Professor Ewald de Meyer, uh, Professor Yerdigan, Professor Sanguinetti, they were just, just looking at the score, you know where the modulations are and you can tell right away. You see an accidental, you know. That's, is that something, the implication, you just look at the score and you know where you start, where you're going, how you end? That's all just part. How did the Neapolitans grasp that information? How did they learn to just identify the, the change of key? I think it's just a matter of uh, playing the bass line without any figures. You can see it from the bass line. Right. Uh, you identify the cadences. Um, so that that would be the first question to ask a student. So so play the whole piece once with just one hand, and where are the cadences? So okay. where are the relations? Right. Yeah, that's it. important information to be able to, in order to be able to realize the piece. And these partimenti must be stressed. Are they improvised on the spot? Yeah, that's. A, the, the question is what we mean by improvisation. Um, I think uh, there is a reason why these pieces are are notated the way they are. So you don't have empty staves on top where the student is filling in the right. the, the other hand. Never. Uh, it's always <laughs> it's always just a baseline. And the reason is that there is not one solution, but there are like five or six or seven. Right. So, so the whole idea of Patimento is to, to learn to play and to make realizations in many different directions. But they have so, to be correct. Yeah, they mm. have to be nice. Right. They have to follow yeah. what it's trying to teach. Yeah, yeah. I think the, there is, a, there is a, clearly a curriculum and there, there are clearly ideas that the, mm. that the the teacher wants to uh, to get across to the to the student definitely brilliant okay so so this is durante so um, if we sum in the same way what what we can see in the school of durante then we could say the durante partimenti and and this tradition they are built through elements rather than through themes mm. That if, if we summarize what it's all about, we, we just put it in a nutshell. Um, the elements are organized in what the Durante tradition calls regole, mm. right? And they contain cadences, scales, and sequences. That are, that are the, the standard elements of, uh, of, of this tradition. So Durante will teach you the figures systematically. You will get examples of the fourth and you will vary them and then the seventh and the ninth and the four two chord the uh, sharp four two chord etc etc and they are always varied uh, varied in, in not in one way but they are done in many different ways so that's all also very important can you um peter just before you go on uh contained within scales do you mean like Fenaroli asks his student to learn the rule of the octave? Did the school of Durante create that sort of uh, idea of the, the rule of the octave where you're just, you need to practice the set formula, at least at the beginning? Yeah, I, if, you, if you look at the terminology that the Neapolitans use, they talk about scales. Hmm. And, uh, and actually also the, the, the Bologna tradition, they they talk about scales and not the rule of the octave. The rule of the octave is a, a rather late term, term that appears somewhere in 1820s or something like that for mm. the first time. Really? 1820? <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's quite late. It's after the period that I have studied, at least. Okay. Um, but uh, um, what you can see also with scales is that there are, there's not one way to do it because the rule of the octave gives, gives us the impression that it's fixed. Right, right. It's right. Um, but I think if you look at the counterpoint notebooks, you see that there are. It's the same there. They, there are many variations of of patterns over a scale. And by a and scale, so we're talking about not just a because when people, when people hear scales, piano students hear scales. We think of the up and down, the, the seven note scales. 
But here, are you? What, what, can you be clear what you mean by scale? Yeah, in in the um, here the scale is often in the base, right? Okay. So durante the tradition will always put the base the scale in the base, and they would learn to make uh, variations over the scale. So one melody or maybe two melodies, and then um, uh, some suspensions and, and this figure and, and, and this combination. And then uh, um, the, what we call the rule of the octave would be the, the block chord positions. Mm. In, so the, the later you come, the more fixed it becomes. I see. And the more the level went down of the student. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually very important to to know also that when this was at, at its peak, um, when it really was really really good, it wasn't very fixed. Mm. You know? It becomes fixed when the students are lost. <laughs> you know, they, they, they 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 tell them use these fingers and uh, right. If you push this button, it will be correct, right? Right. And right. that would be the case if you have a really good students in the 1730s, 40s, where the level was really high, they wouldn't do that. Right. And that's a, at least my my, uh, my my opinion. So a Chimarosa, a Paisiello, when they were students, they would learn many variations of ascending and descending scales in the bass. They would never... They, well, well, they would not have the sort of fixed uh, system that we that uh, a lot of people are familiar with, at least. Yeah, I think it's also a little bit the question of uh, of which school we are talking about. The old fashioned school didn't want to fix things. The more modern school, they had a tendency to 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 fix things. Okay. So you see these uh, these standard patterns more often in the Durante tradition than in the Leo tradition. Okay. Also in Bologna, uh, all, uh, still in the, 18, in the early 19th century, you have many variations of scales with all kinds of figures uh, in, in, in Mattai, for example. Huh? He, he even has additional scales <laughs> uh, apart from the eight scales that he shows on, in his printed volume. There are even more. <laughs> So it's right. also lots of variations of of, uh, of scales. Very good. Yeah. And this is interesting so, here. The use of a double counterpoint is downplayed considerably, especially in Partimento. Yeah. So if we if we look at uh, if we try to find fugues in Partimento by the uh, by Durante, I think there are two, <laughs> maybe th maybe three. <laughs> So the, the in in Leo there are many many more. Sala has sixty fugues. Okay, sixty partimento fugues. What's Sala's connection with Leonardo Leo? He was his student. He was a uh, Leo's student. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Great. All right. So I yeah. guess we're done characterizing the school of Durante. Moving forward, I see here. Uh, can you explain what this is? Is this from a, a manuscript? Yeah, so this is a. Now I would like to 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 test you. <laughs> okay, put me on the spot. Okay. <laughs> so what do you think? What what could this be? Is this Durante or Leo tradition? Oh, okay. Uh, I can't go back then. <laughs> I can't go back. Okay, so I would say that this is. Um, I would say this is Leo because of the dissonances. Okay. Uh, but there are not very many ties, are there? Oh, no. Yeah, you're right. There's almost no ties. I don't see a tie. Are there any ties? Okay, I can I change my answer? <laughs> I'd like to change to Durante now. Yeah, so so um, also the text uh, above and underneath, they, they are, this is about how to prepare the fourth, right? So this okay. is an elementary approach. Right. Um, okay, this is very difficult because um, when when we look at the front page of this manuscript, it says um, "elementi um, 
the Nicola Sala. Okay, so it's attributed to Nicola Sala. Yeah. The one would think, okay, pieces by Sala, interesting. But then what, when I put everything in the database, I find connections with Paisiello, <laughs> I find connections with Insanguine, and I find these bases in counterpoint notebooks from the 1750s at Onofrio. <laughs> okay, so Paisiello, Insanguine, counterpoint notebook from Onofrio, and this one with a strange attribution. So three or four point at uh, Onofrio, 1750s. Okay. okay so this is from Onofrio, 1750s. Lack of ties, and we see the 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 elementary approach, meaning focusing on a particular type of pedagogical unit. Yes. So this is a, 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 a partimento that is designed to train the student to prepare the fourth right. and to make a, a proper resolution. Right. Right. Very interesting. Yeah. Okay. All right. How about so this, this one? Is the we take the next one. Okay. Now I don't see ties here. Uh, no? no, I see a tie. I see a tie. Okay. I see one. Um, I mean, I will just go and say, I will say Leo. Yeah. Well, if you take the next, the, the, the second one of this page. Let me take a look. Yeah. Not the, the previous. Oh, uh, the previous page. one. Yeah. So there oh, is one it. called five and one called six. Oh, I see. Yeah. Would five and six. Look at the number six. You can see the elements in the in the figures. There's six four five three. Right. Six four five three. Okay. Then there's right. one tie. You are correct. And another tie. There's a couple four. of ties here. Four two chords. And then six four five three. Six four five three. So six, we're four, seeing five. an element of six four five three as a pedagogical. Yeah. Thing here we're testing the, the so compound cadence. Yeah, so what we see here is a partimento that trains the student to do two different things. It's sounding so, more like a Durante partimento. Yes. Uh, this is actually, we know what this is because this is an autograph by uh, Kotomachi. Okay. Yeah. So here we are, uh, we know which conservatory he taught and we know in what tradition he worked. So although he was a very outstanding church musician and he was an excellent uh, counterpoint teacher, um, this is this is part of the Durante curriculum. Right. Uh, elementary approach, I would say. So would uh, a Leo Partimenti have more varied sort of... Uh, it wouldn't be just about a single kind of element. It would be varied with many different things. Yeah, in the in the layer tradition, we are looking for themes hmm. and other subjects. Okay, but right. wouldn't the later Durante Partimenti, his more advanced ones, mix them up a bit more, or is he always unitary all the way right till the end? Yeah, they become di more difficult to to identify just because he mixes up more elements, right? So one partimento may be about, not about one element or two, but maybe four different elements. Okay. And then it becomes very difficult to, to see in the end. Okay. Okay. So that's true. So the next one. Here's a piece by a, a, an obscure uh, composer. Uh, his name is Nicola Calandro. And there's not much known about Calandro. But anyway, this is a partimento. It's called Fuga, right? You see here, uh, they, they, uh, they change clefs. Right. Soprano, Lots. tenor, yes. Yeah, this looks very much like Leo tradition, doesn't it? I was just going to say that, and... Um... This is this is more in the the, the um, so the, they because you said Durante you could, could only find two fugues right in uh, in his Partimenti collection right so if you see fugues yeah. it's, it's probably going to be more from the Leo school just for the yeah. sheer quantity yeah 
Now, this is a little bit tricky um, because uh, Calandro's teacher was not Leo, but actually Feo, okay. uh, Francesco Feo. And Feo was another student of Nicola Fago. Mm. So it's the same uh, lineage as, or very similar to, to Leo tradition. He's like a cousin, so to speak. Yeah, yeah it's, 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 it's more or less the same. Okay. I would say Feo has a, is a kind of middle position between Durante and, and Leo. He also uses an elementary approach, but he works towards um, uh, Battimento Fuchs. Can I ask, Peter, was the, I guess, the conflict, if there was such a thing, the conflict between the two schools in terms of, of their two camps, was it rancorous? Were they, were they very firmly against each other? Was it, or was it like a kind of friendly rivalry? You, you write in your very good book that I think everyone should read, which is your Countermort and Partimento book, which is an excellent book. The Durante school seemed to have popularly won out. Uh, can you describe the, 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 I guess, the dynamic between the two schools? Yeah, I think as soon as uh, uh, Leo had died in 1744 and Durante had died in 1755, these tensions between these two schools uh, increased. Um, at least that's my impression. Um, probably because they had to, it was difficult to reach the level of Durante and Leo. And some some uh, German uh, journalist comments in the 1770s that uh, that the level in the in the Neapolitan Conservatory was absolutely not as good as he had had expected. Right. You know, he he, uh, he standards says, had fallen. Yeah, very much so. And and when he asks himself, it's a, this is a little German article in a in a German newspaper. When he asks himself, what is the reason that the level is so low? Um, <laughs> he answers something like. Um, in, in Germany, he writes something like, um, weil die scharfeste Köpfe nicht mehr da sind, while, while, because the, the sharpest heads are not around anymore. <laughs> <laughs> so, so he really thought it had to do with the level of the, of the masters right. that would be there. Now, yeah. per, do we know if Leo and Durante... What was their relationship? I know Durante was actually older. He was around Bach's age, 1980, oh, sorry, 18, 17, no, 1684, I think he was born, something like that. Leo yeah. was a little bit younger. Um, yeah. Do we know if, I mean, I would love to read biographies of these men, but do they have any, do we know if they had any personal connection, relationship? Uh, is the information just not there? No, we, we, they were around in the same uh, city for many, many decades. So, of course, they knew each other's music and they appreciated each other's music, I'm, I'm quite sure. Um, and they heard each other's compositions when new things appeared. And so didn't, both... didn't, didn't one of them replace the other in the same institution? Like, they, like one is, did that happen? Absolutely. So... This uh, this um, this idea that one one conservatory became a Leo conservatory and the other right. two became Durante conservatory that is for that counts for the the, the period after the, their death ah. but before it's all quite mixed up. Okay, <laughs> that's, that's the reason why I think this rivalry uh, increased after their death between. The, the students of these maestri became... It's yes, very interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting. Okay. So now uh, I see there's another example here. Let's, let's dive into this one. Yeah. So uh, here we see... This is a little bit difficult to see, but if we hear the bass...
I would play it more simple than this phrase, for example, could be simplified by playing. You see that? I'm gonna. I'm. I think I'm. I'm down two in my in my guess. <laughs> so I'm gonna try now. Okay. I'm gonna. I'm gonna explain my reasoning. So oh. clearly, I can hear bass motions here. I can hear the up four down five. I wouldn't hear the Monte Romanesca as well. I would say even though it is mixed, that there's more than one thing, I'm going to say Durante. Yes, that's correct. So this is clearly a, a, a base motion exercise, right? But it's a little bit disguised because there's a lot of things going and filling these, these simple base motions that probably were played a little bit more dry in the beginning. And then they get a little bit more elaborated into a piece. Huh? Yeah. Peter, so, can I ask you one question? You you mentioned earlier that there was perhaps five to seven or more ways of realizing a partimento. For students today or teachers teaching partimento, what's the number of realizations that perhaps they should at least have as a minimum before saying, okay, we've so we really do understand this partimento now we can move on to the next one. Yeah. So this is one of my points with what I what I would like to try to 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 stress here that it uh, the Durante tradition is very much based on variation of elements, right? So if you have a piece from the Durante tradition, the very idea of the of the partimento uh, pedagogy is don't do it the same every time, mm. but try to try to find uh, a variation here, a variation there. Of course, it's not bad with repetition, so you can absolutely repeat things uh, in the same way, but try to exploit the possibilities in the partimento to become fluent in getting into various directions. Okay. Yeah. The school of Leo is not it's not the, the core idea of the School of Leo to make variations. The core idea of the School of Leo is to make good lines. Yeah? And okay. you can do that in different ways, but it's not all about, okay, let's do this in five different ways, but it's rather, if I start in this position, what lines would I get? I, see. I, like, I like this line. I think it's more beautiful than this one. Right? Mm. So it's... It's a, a slightly different approach, I would say. If I were a student with Durante, oh well, let's let's how 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 would I put this? Let's say I'd been studying quite diligently with Durante, and then I just for whatever reason I have to go and change teachers. Would I would I be wrong? Would I have to relearn everything with Leonardo Leo? Would he say to me like, no, 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 we're going to do it a different way? Would the information that I learned with one teacher translate, uh, or really is it so philosophically different that it's almost a different way of realizing? Yeah, excellent question. I I think um, there's a lot of overlap. So the things you learn in the Durante tradition will be of enormous use also in the Leo tradition. Mm. But from the point of understanding um, how a partimento fugue works, you will be a complete beginner if you come from the Durante school into the Leo school. And you would probably uh, be obliged to start to sing a few Leo solfeggi, two-part solfeggio fugues to understand uh, the, the construction of the fugue and the standard elements there and to learn to apply that in a few partimento fugues in order to catch up with your students that already know that <laughs> a lot right. better. So I think, yeah, there, there, there are, there's a lot of overlap, but there's also difficulties to, to get into the more old fashioned counterpoint. I think. Now I, I have to ask uh, one follow-up question to that, which is Fenaroli has a book, I guess you say if we go according to Imbimbo, he has a book five and a book six dealing with fugues. Now, he is a Durante student or a disciple, you could say, according to that lineage. And yet he has more fugues in his later books. Is he more of a blend 
a more a younger sort of blend of the schools? Yeah, also very good question. Um, um, and it's a, this is a difficult one. Um, we have to remember that when Fenaroli started to teach uh, in the in early 1770s, late 1760s, he, he had been working with book one, two, three, four, right. until 1810. <laughs> okay, so 50 years of teaching. The same without, part without of the Without the fugues. Okay. And and there is a there is a problem growing in Naples in the 1790s, where people became a little bit desperate. Uh, this is this is so embarrassing for us in the Neapolitan school. Nobody can play the keyboard anymore. Nobody can make any mm. fugues anymore. The level is so low. Right. We have to we have to write a letter to the king. <laughs> uh, he he needs to help us. And that the, the 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 first librarian of the of the Mayala Conservatory Library, he 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 wrote a letter to the king and complained about the situation, and the, and the king intervened and and uh, and and put some things in place to to make the situation better. And one okay. of the things they did was to try and restore the old contrapuntal style. So in the seventeen nineties. There are ambitions growing to restore these old fugues, okay. and this is the point where, for example, the 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 Durante materials gets a fourth section of fugues, which are not mm. by Durante but by old, very good Neapolitan composers from the mm. from the early 18th century, right? Like Veneziano and Greco and and Leo, they are at the end of the. Of the standard material of Durante, and they are now. I mean, people st still think they, these are by by Durante, but they are not. <laughs> they are absolutely by by lots of different old time composers. A few are so old that uh, that uh, Durante was uh, was uh, hardly a, even born. There's wow. one piece that can be connected to to the 1685 or something like that. Wow! Wow! Yeah? And the golden age of Partimento, is that Leo and Durante? But what about before Leo and Durante? Yeah, there, there, is, a, there is a lot of uh, material also by, by... Actually, we could, we could look at... Uh, if you... Yeah. Let me, should you, I bring up the, the... You want me to bring up the browser? The, the slide oh, number the slide? eight. Okay, Num uh, number eight. Okay. 18. 18. 18. All right, here we are. Zoom That's cool. So this is a piece uh, that is, I think, from the 1730s or so. The mm. composer is Nicola Fago. So he was the teacher of, of Leo and also the teacher of Sala. Right? Right. Now look at, the, at how this starts. Yeah, so this is a, a double fugue. So the theme is and then the, the counter subject is an imitation. Okay. Now if you go to the next page. Number 19. Yeah. You see the piece from where this is taken. So this is actually a, a, a Kyrie from a mass by Fargo. Oh. Yeah, so the organ part of this choral piece is actually the, the Partimento in a Partimento mm. collection, which is yeah. fantastic news because that will help us to get a realization right. from, the comp from the composer himself. Now, is this a published mass and you you did the the detective work to kind of find the partimento and then attach it to a mass or is this in a counterpoint textbook or a, a, a just part of the conservatory itself well first of all it's not me who who identified this it's actually uh, an american uh, musicologist stephen sheeran who identified this one 
uh, in his dissertation. Uh, and after him, I, I managed to identify 19 others. 19, uh, okay. Yes. So this was the very first one that was identified. Um, so these are our partimenti that are in fact baselines for vocal works. Mm. And these are extremely important because they help us to understand the Leo tradition more deeply because we get the solutions of the composers. Yes, you get the full realization. It's wonderful. So there are a few by Leo, there are a few by Fago, and there are, and there are quite a few by Sala. Incredible. Incredible. Yeah. That's, that's wonderful. So I, I, I uh, give, uh, give these in the appendix of my dissertation, these 20 pieces. That's wonderful. Well, I can find them all. And a few of them are... And by your dissertation, you're referring to your book, Counterpoint and Partimento. Okay, yes. great. Yeah. Now... I would like to, to, uh, to round this off by, by, by doing a little... So to reason uh, along this line, what we've been talking about, and to show what happens when, when we do this um, in playing, yeah, so this this piece what we see here is now by Leo. Yeah, and we see the the many ties in this piece. Yes. Um, now the first thing uh, to ask if you play Leo uh, material is, where do I start? So, should I start with a chord like this, or should I um, place my hand like this? Or should I perhaps do something like this? Hmm. Yeah. I like the last one most because if I let the upper voices start after each other, the advantage is that the lines become more individual. Right. Okay. So it is a great help to use rests in your realization in the school of Leo. Right. Yeah. It rests are are excellent, uh, an excellent mean to to um, to create individuality of the voices. Do we have? I know we have Guarnaccia, Catalina, uh, a bunch of people for the Fenaroli realizations. Do we have realizations for the Leo school of Partimenti available? Yeah, the ones that I just shown the the, the so realization, the, the Kyrie, those masses. But what about for keyboard realization? Um, there are a few um, examples by Leo which are given in full. Really? Wow. Yeah. But um, the question is, they're given like it's like a, a full piece, and you could go back and make a partimento out of it. Okay. <laughs> And you could start over and see what did he do with it. He did. Um, I know he he published some toccata that are quite. I know a lot of piano students play his toccatas. Uh, they're, they're quite popular pieces. Is yeah. that is his keyboard real uh, toccatas? Are they sort of a good model almost for a partimento realization? The way he writes these two voice uh, keyboard works. Yeah, absolutely. There are many elements in these toccatas that are of of, uh, of great value for for the the Leo tradition. Brilliant. Yeah. So if I play play along a little bit and just I will I will talk while I play. So if I start like this. <laughs> The seventh comes here. Okay, I have to resolve that. Okay, so this would be one way to do it. Another option could be to start like this. So 
you have to pick uh, which point to start with in order to to see do i want to have a a line that is descending or do i want to have a line that is ascending on which upper line has the best melodic qualities yeah and peter are you um what's your preference for two voice versus three voice in terms of a more advanced realization now you mentioned the the later of the options rather than the chordal appeals to you more uh two voice three voice what do you think yeah in this uh, in more old fashioned contrapuntal style it it's good to use one voice two voice and three voice okay and and only occasionally maybe four voice where you really think ah i'm missing the fourth tone in this diminished seventh chord i really should <laughs> add one you know you, you right. can do that right right but uh, I think the basic of the style in the Leo school is very much uh, um, like it's based on Corelli trio sonata style. Mm. So, so independent lines above a lot of imitations, many themes and counter subjects. Right. But three part style works better than four part style in most cases. Right. Right. Yeah. There is a. Uh, if you're done with this, there's one more slide. You want to take a look at that one? Yeah, just to show the difference. Now we are getting into the school of Durante and yeah. see. <laughs> this is one of the of the what we today uh, know, know as the numerati. Um, and what does numerati mean? Why is why is it called that? Yeah. So this is a term that that is not used in in any of the 18th century sources for Durante Partimenti. So it's a later term. Okay. But as soon as they started to, to organize them differently, like 40 or 50 years after Durante's death, they take all the ones that have figures and call them numerati. Hmm. Um, if you look at the curriculum and the intentions of the curriculum, then you could say that the numerati are those pieces in which Durante wants to train these elements. Mm. Yeah? So if you have a, a partimento with figures by Durante or by Durante tradition, it's probably the start of the, of the training where the, the teacher has been learning you the fourths, the sevens, the nines, and all these elements. Yeah? And then you're training these elements. Mm. Uh, so in this case, the question to us players becomes, what's the purpose of this piece? So what's, what, it, what is it all about? And sometimes it's not easy to see it at once, but... I think what is uh, needed here is something like this. So maybe this element can be used. So I put this element in the middle voice in the cadence, right? So it means that I maybe could do something like this. I'm hearing the imitation uh, yeah, put in, elements. and that's that's and that's quite an advanced uh, uh, realization because now you're at the level of imitation. Yeah, you, absolutely. So, so 
what is needed here. So you have the element and you have to, to find uh, ways to make variations of these. So I had as the variations this, but also So small rhythmical things and small melodic things, small, small elements, it's almost the same. But these slight variations, they are important, I think, to create uh, a vital yeah, vitality in the, in, the, in the performance of a piece like this. Oh, I love that it was really great to see you and hear you playing the realizations. Um, as we wrap up, Peter, um, we didn't get a chance much to talk about Bologna, and you have a very excellent edition of uh, two books, really. One by Gian Battista Martini, or well known as Padre Martini, the famous 18th century teacher who taught Mozart, who taught Johann Christian Bach. And you also have an edition by his protege, his student, Stanislav Matei. Uh, can you comment on, on the Bologna school? I think that would be very interesting to hear about. Yeah, the, the Bologna school is, uh, is um, I mean, it was the, the, the other um, very important center for learning keyboard counterpoint in Italy at the time. So many students went to went to Naples and then to Bologna or first to Bologna and then to Naples. <laughs> there are actually quite a few who went to both cities, you know, so maybe one year there and then one year there before they went home to their home country. Right, right. Yeah, yeah and the tradition is comparable. Um, I think Martini's teaching uh, also starts with a lot of, um, with a lot of uh, keyboard practicing. He calls it accompagnamento. Yeah, so he calls it accompaniment. But he also uses his, uh, his accompaniment exercises as the basis in his counterpoint notebooks, which is very interesting. So it's, it's uh, quite similar to what was done in, in Naples. And um... Can you talk about this particular book and uh, how extensive is the course compared to, like, for instance, Fenneroli has a number of books, four books. So if you go by Imbimbo, three with the new Professor Ewald de Mera, critical edition. What do you cover in this book? Um, yeah, well, it's, it's uh, basically a, a transcription of the, of the autograph, which is in Bologna today. Um, and um, it starts with uh, with whole note against whole note, simple counterpoint. So just making lines over a over a bass line, um, and it it studies uh, also double counterpoint stuff, uh, lots of uh, varied ca cadences. So you get one cadence, and then you get twenty different realizations in with different figures uh, over one cadence. So it's also, it's similar, uh, the approach is very similar. You, you get small elements and you, you learn to exploit the material um, to its very extremes. Yeah? And, and you learn to do it by, with your fingers on the keyboard, you learn counterpoint practically before you start to write counterpoint. Yeah? And so is, this he, is, what... is he closer to Leo versus then, then Durante in terms of the approach? In the material, I would say that yes, it's more old-fashioned. He was very old-fashioned. And what about his student Stanislaw Matei? You also have uh, worked on this book, which you've also published. So I, I have this as well. Could you talk about his student's approach, Stanislaw Matei, who, by the way, I think for people who don't know, taught very famous people. Uh, Rossini, he taught. Did he teach Donizetti? I'm, I'm not sure. Uh, I, th I believe he also taught 
the teacher of Richard Wagner, Christian Weinlich. So this is a very, very influential um, teacher. Can you talk about this publication? Yeah, I, I've used this myself in my teaching, and I, I really like like to use it. The great thing with uh, with Mattei is that uh, his his uh, partimenti are very very uh, small. There are just five six uh, measures each, uh, and that allows the student to memorize the lines. So if you play them as contrapuntal small contrapuntal pieces of of just five six uh, measures. And you and you get a lot of sequential patterns. So then it just suffices to to imitate one or two bars, and then you repeat, and then you learn the the thing, and then you make a cadence at the end. So uh, very it's, useful. This is, this is really ear training. This is ear training. You can use this in ear training classes. It's a, it's a ex excellent material for ear training classes, I would say, with the hands on the keyboard. Yeah, so, very good. So that's the 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 uh, scales and versets by Stanislaw Mate. And I just wanted to draw attention to three manuscripts. The Gallipoli. This is related to Francesco Durante. Do you want to just tell? The audience, what these three volumes, or rather these two volumes, one A and one B, what are they about? Yeah, the Gallipoli manuscript is a is a an exceptional case where we find a, a student. Um, he could be a student of Durante, or maybe a student of a student of Durante. I estimate this being from the seventeen fifties, maybe seventeen sixties. Um, it is preserved today in the Gallipoli uh, uh, City Library, and it, it it's actually uh, um, realizations of of um, Durante's um, advanced course of Partimenti. Mm. Um, the pieces are more advanced than the realizations, though, because this, the student <laughs> was not, not not very very good. Okay. <laughs> So there are many mistakes in these realizations, but it's still very interesting to to see how this was done by um, by a, probably a young a young student who who wanted to write down what he what so he there's learned. still things of value to be found, even with mistakes aside. There's still valuable uh, um, material there that he probably absorbed from his teacher, maybe. Yeah. Well, the good thing is that this is actually authentic material from the time where you can see how a student, even though it's not, uh, I mean, it, it was probably not the best student of Durante, but you can see what happened there. You can see that many of these realizations shift from, from three-part settings to four-part settings and sometimes two-part settings. That's very important information for us who are playing today that you, you have this flexibility to shift from two-part, three-part, uh, four part, right? Absolutely. And I uh, just one final thing. Uh, of course, uh, Peter, you're very well known for this excellent book, your dissertation, Counterpoint and Partimento. And also, we should draw people's attention to the Partimenti of Nicolas Sala as well. Um, Peter, before we wrap up, would you like to mention any any book, anything we missed in this interview uh, that we should talk about? Well, one one new book that is going to appear. That's not my book, but it's uh, it's something that appears maybe this week. Uh, that's John Mortensen's book yes. on improvising fugue. Yes. So, if I may draw attention to one thing that is that is actually new for this week, <laughs> I would say uh, John Mortensen's fugue book. I haven't seen it yet, uh, at least not in print, but. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to to look at that. I would say that uh, we should send this book to number one, <laughs> not just in the musical category. Just send it to number one as in on Amazon uh, because uh, it, first of all, it it deserves to be number one because it's the great Professor John Mortensen. 
but uh, also, you know, it's a great aid for, for, for people to learn something that is quite intimidating for, for people, the idea of a fugue. And I think this will, this will really help uh, to change uh, and, and assist yeah. people. Uh, and uh, I will actually announce that he is, will be coming on the show shortly. So that'll be very interesting. We can talk about the book. So, uh, well, what can I say? I mean, it's been a fantastic time with you, Peter. Uh, the great Professor Peter Van Tour. We're ending off right now, but uh, um, would you like to mention anything you're working on uh, for upcoming for the rest of the year? It's the year is still young. Uh, what should we should we mention anything? Uh, any articles or, or projects you have lined up? Yeah, well, I'm working on a. I I, I hope to be able to to finish uh, my book on on Bologna tradition. But it's 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 not going very fast due to the fact that I'm I've just started a new position. But okay. I'm I I hope to to finish that at least within a few years or so. Uh, will it be like a like a music in the Galant style style kind of like a book which which talk or like your dissertation which investigates the the tradition in a very detailed way? Yeah, it's a, it will be about uh, about. I would like to draw draw uh, uh, lines between the solfeggio tradition and partimento tradition and see how it how it fits together, because I think that's still missing in the in, in the in the picture today. Right. Well, well, we're very much looking forward to that. I mean, thank you again, Professor Peter Van Tour. You can find him on the Art of Partimento Facebook group. You can send him an email. Just go to his website here. And uh, Peter, thank you so much for being on the show. Please come back soon. Take care. Thank you so much, Nico. It was a pleasure. Thank you.